Just a cook? Art repeated, skepticism evident in his voice. Somehow I have a hard time believing that. The head chef shrugged, untying her apron and tossing it to Nifia. Titles are merely embellishments that establish a hierarchy. So yes, I am Chef Astera. Nice to meet you. Surprised by her wisdom, Art nodded in acknowledgement. And I am Arthur. The pleasure is mine. Well then, Arthur, let's put on a show for these antsy soldiers before they start throwing a fit. Her lips curved into a confident smile as she held up the ladle in her hand. Of course, will that be your weapon? Don't be silly. It'd be disrespectful to fight with a tool used to cook. With a hearty laugh, Madame Estera motioned to one of the soldiers at the front for his weapon. A short sword, much like the one Art was borrowing. Now do go easy on an old lady like me. With that, she vanished from view, moving at a speed no simple cook could have managed. Madame Estera reappeared in the air above Art, already poised to strike down, her handsome face glowing with savage excitement. With a quick sidestep, Art brought up his sword. Sparks flew as the edges of their blades met. Before Madame Astera's sword hit the ground, she kicked off the guard of his sword to gain distance. Infusing only a minimal amount of mana into his body and sword, Art felt his hand go numb from blocking her attack. A simple cook? He questioned. Just a simple cook, she replied with a wink, before rushing at him again. Their swords became mere blurs in the space between them as Madame Astera and Art unleashed a flurry of attacks. Madame Astera's petite body moved with a coordinated agility that would have impressed Cordry, the Asura who had trained Art. They dodged each other's strikes and swings with minimal movement. If not for the sweat pouring down their faces and necks, it might have looked as if they were missing on purpose. Art increased his mana output to 20%, but she seemed to have been holding back as well, because they remained at a stalemate. Neither of them had the luxury to speak. It took all their focus to keep up with each other's attacks, but their emotions showed on their faces. This wasn't a duel of magic, just a contest of pure mastery of the sword. Madame Estera wore an ecstatic grin on her sweaty face as she continued her relentless assault. And somewhere along the way, Art realized he was smiling as well. He countered each strike she delivered, but she flawlessly dodged until her back was against the earthen cage. He decided not to raise his mana, but instead used the field to his advantage. Dipping below her waist, he brought his sword close, in position to swing up. She had nowhere to move but to her right, or so he thought. When she was barely an arm's length away, she kicked off the wall and propelled herself directly at him. Art quickly pivoted on his right foot, whirling just in time for her blade to whiz past his cheek. The tables had turned. Now it was his back against the wall. There's a saying, something like, even a mouse will attack when cornered, Madame Astera said, her sword raised closely in guard. Art smiled. Looks like I'm the cornered mouse now. Hence my caution, she smirked, tightening her grip on the raised sword. Why don't you stop holding back, Arthur? I think bringing any magic past basic augmentation into such an exciting duel would be disrespectful to the way of the sword, he replied. Wise words from one so young. She nodded in approval. Then shall we kick things up a notch? A surge of mana suddenly burst from her as she took a step back. The soldiers in the front row winced from the sudden thick gust of energy, while others had to lean forward to keep from toppling over in their seats. Art smiled and increased his mana output to 40%. A thick wave of mana burst out from him as well, but it was different from Madame Astera's. While her mana took the form of a sharp and chaotic gale, his manifested as a refined wave-like pulse. Madame Astera's smile faded as she looked at him in awe. Then, shaking herself out of her daze, she molded her mana into thick armor around her before lunging at him. The force of her initial step created a small crater beneath her feet, shaking the entire arena. In the span of a single breath, her sword was already inches away from his throat, and the force of her strike sent a spear of wind sailing past his neck, creating a hole in the wall behind him. Art could see why Nephia was so scared of this simple cook. After her initial strike failed, 
she leaped back and repositioned herself, tightening her stance like a coiled snake, ready to strike. But this time, Art was the one to strike. He dashed forward, creating no sound as he flashed beside her with his sword in mid-swing. She immediately ducked. With no time to prepare, her movement was sloppy, but the fact that she could react to his attack at all showed how keen her instincts were. She lashed out with a sharp swing before leaping back again. This time, she didn't wait for him to strike. Instead, she lunged once more. Art brought up his sword but realized midway that her stab was a feint as she dipped into a wide swing at his leg. She wanted him to jump up to dodge so she could catch him mid-air. Instead, Art brought his sword down to parry. A high-pitched ringing resounded from their blades clashing. A deep tremor rose up his arm from the impact, and then his sword shattered. For a moment, they just stood there, both winded and perhaps a little disappointed at the abrupt conclusion of their battle. Finally, Art said, It's my loss, Chef Astera. No, I can't accept that. It was just that your sword's quality. He shook his head. I think it's time for dinner anyway, right? He walked over to the soldier he had borrowed the sword from. I'm sorry about your sword. I'll get you a new one. What? Oh, yeah, sure. No problem. The soldier's voice trailed off as he stared at Art blankly. Noticing his awestruck expression, Art realized how quiet the camp had become. He looked around to see everyone with the same expression as the soldier in front of him, the only sound being the occasional crackle of wood coming from the fires. You heard the boy? Move your asses or starve for the rest of the night, Madame Astera roared. We're going all out tonight. With that, the silent crowd erupted into cheers, and the cooks began handing out plates stacked with steaming food. The atmosphere quickly turned festive as Madame Astera brought out barrels of liquor. Art spotted Venezi trying to limit the amount of alcohol being passed around, but she finally gave in, taking a glass for herself. He wasn't sure it was a good idea to drink when they were supposed to be on the lookout for any stray enemy ships, but the chances of that happening were too meager to stop the soldiers from having at least one good night. With a few drinks in everyone's system, the soldiers became more outgoing. Some began singing, while others accompanied them, using a hollow log as a makeshift percussive instrument. The songs seemed like melodic tales of adventurers with no real thought put into rhythm, but it was enjoyable nonetheless, especially once Art had a few drinks in him as well. Should a lance succumb to peer pressure and drink so much? Sylvie berated him, choosing to stay inside his cloak for warmth. Who says it's peer pressure? Art replied, taking another sip and relishing the warm numbness spreading from the alcohol and from the fire as well. Do you mind if I join you? Madame Astera asked, taking a seat next to him by the dancing flames, a glass of liquor in her hand. So who exactly is Arthur? Not at all, Art replied. He was thankful for the chef's presence, since the curious soldiers lingering around him began dispersing as soon as she came over. And I thought you already knew. I knew you weren't just a normal boy. She shrugged before gulping down the rest of the liquor in her glass. Art followed suit and took another sip as well. Then may I ask who you are? I told you I'm just a... Yeah, that simple cook answer of yours isn't going to cut it, he interrupted. She burst out with a hearty laugh that didn't match her small frame. Fine, I'll answer. But you could have probably found out from some of the soldiers here. A lot of them were my students, after all. So you were a teacher? At Zyrus? Oh, please. I'd rather swallow a gallon of fire sand than teach at that school, she retorted. I happen to have been a student there, Art replied, pretending to be offended. Then you know how stuck up most of those kids are, she shot back. Can't argue with that. Art felt a pang of discomfort at the recollection of some unwelcome memories, but pushed the feeling aside. After the war with the elves, I decided to teach at Lancelor Academy, she said, gazing idly at the fire through her empty glass. You've heard of us, right? Of course, Art answered, recalling his research on the once prestigious school located in Kalberk City, near the center of Sapin, the legendary school for any would-be elite soldiers. Except that after the war, there was little demand for soldiers, she sighed, fogging up her glass with her breath. 
More nobles wanted their children to attend Zyrus now that there is so little tension between the races. I see, Art muttered. Still, this war against the Alacrians should have brought quite a few new students to Lancelor. No offense, but what are you doing here as a chef? That's a story for another time, Madame Astera said, shaking her cup. A time with more booze. Art raised his glass. I'll take you up on that offer. Now, onto your story. What's a talent like you doing here, and why in the world did you decide to go to Zyrus with that level of skill with the sword? Because I could manage by myself with the sword. It was magic that I needed help getting better at, Art replied. Her eyes widened in surprise. No kidding. Art nodded and was about to elaborate further when the clank of armored footsteps drew his attention. General, I mean, sir. The guard who had been stationed outside Professor Glory's tent quickly covered his mouth, his eyes wide with fear as he darted glances between Art and Madame Astera. Despite the noise of the festive gathering around them, the guard's slip-up had caught everyone's attention and heads turned to look in their direction. The guard lowered his voice in a futile attempt to correct his error. Captain Otter has arrived, and Captain Glory is nowhere to be found. Art turned back to the head chef, who was furrowing her brows in confusion. Well, there's my story. He said General, Madame Astera said, turning to the guard. You did say General, didn't you? The guard, unsure how to respond, glanced at Art questioningly. Art simply stood up, careful not to disturb Sylvie, who was sleeping in his cloak. Come on, let's go find your captain, Art said, turning back to the chef and holding up his empty glass. At a time with more booze, Madame Astera's expression softened into a smile. Aye. As they walked toward the main tent, Art scanned the tops of the large boulders, hoping to spot the captain. Knowing her, he doubted she'd be able to fully relax. There she is, Art said, squinting. The guard took a moment to locate the shadowed figure of Captain Glory, who was perched atop a boulder that formed the front wall of the encampment. Thank you, the guard said, starting in her direction. Art held him back. Let me handle it. Tell Captain Otter I'll meet with him first thing tomorrow morning. But the captain, it's fine, Art interjected, handing the guard his empty glass. There's nothing urgent going on, and I've had a bit too much alcohol to entertain a stranger tonight. Yes, General. With a salute, the guard turned and headed towards the tent. Art exhaled deeply, his breath forming a mist in the chilly air. He wrapped himself in a shroud of wind and prepared to leap. The thin layer of frost beneath his feet crunched as he pushed off the ground. Where are we headed now? Sylvie asked, sounding noticeably sleepy through their mental link. Checking that his bond was settled, Art answered wryly as he approached Venezi. She glanced over her shoulder before turning her gaze back toward the moonlit gray ocean. Want another drink? Should the lookout be drinking? Art asked, taking a seat beside her as Sylvie emerged from his woolen cloak. You're one to talk, General, with your cheeks as red as ripe tomatoes, she scoffed, idly stroking Sylvie, who had curled up between them. Give me that. Art took the flask from Venezi's hands and took another gulp of the fiery liquid that burned pleasantly down his throat. Leaning back on her hands, Venezi gazed up at the crescent moon. Do you think we'll be able to win this war? I'm not entirely sure, but I'll do everything I can to ensure we do, he promised. Somehow, despite being half my age, there's something reassuring about your words. 
it's as if you truly believe you can make it happen. Art reflected on the event from three years ago that continued to haunt him. I've let a lot of people down before. I need to make sure I don't do it again. Are you referring to what happened at Zyrus? Venezi asked, her brows furrowing with concern. He simply nodded in response, his gaze fixed on the mesmerizing expanse of the ocean. What's left of Zyrus Academy now? He could feel Venezi's eyes on him, but she remained silent. Tessia doesn't remember much, Art continued. Curtis and Cathiln act like nothing happened, as if they can't face the reality. What exactly happened before I arrived? Arthur, what's done is done. Me telling you this will only make you... I need to know, Venisi. I should have asked much earlier, but I kept making excuses. He interrupted, turning to meet her gaze. With a deep breath, Venisi nodded. In the disciplinary committee, Doradrea was the first to be found dead. Theodore was gravely injured and didn't survive, even with the aid of the Adventurer's Guild's emitters. What about Faerith and Claire? Claire Bladeheart. When I arrived, she'd been stabbed. Did she survive? Venezi nodded again. Faerith Ivsar was badly injured, but he was taken home safely. As for Claire Bladeheart, the family is as secretive as they are old. I was told she was alive, but I don't know her condition. I see. At least she's alive, Art said, relieved that the leader of the disciplinary committee had survived. However, his brief sense of relief faded as Venezi continued to list names of those who were now gone. The sheer number of names was overwhelming, and although not every name was clear, the overall impact was heavy. And, he prompted, noticing her hesitation. Kai Crestless was one of the radical members associated with the Vritra, Dranive. Venizi continued. Kai and the rest of Dranive's robed followers vanished with him, along with Elijah. He's probably the reason Curtis avoided discussing that disaster. I see, Art muttered, turning his gaze back to the ocean. For a long moment, silence enveloped them. The distant commotion and the faint crash of the night's tide were the only sounds breaking the quiet as Art reflected on his brief time at Zyrus. Learning the full extent of what had happened gave him a chance to reflect more deeply. He often found himself forgetting the memories from his past life. His past self's influence had waned over time, allowing him to grow into the person he aspired to be in this world. Yet at this moment, he wished he could revert to his former self, the cold, rational figure who had suppressed his emotions to avoid any vulnerability that could be exploited. Although he had suspected what had occurred, hearing it confirmed made it starkly real. His chest tightened, as if the blood in his heart had thickened to tar, struggling to maintain a steady rhythm. A warm drop of liquid traced down Art's cold face, his chin quivering like an infant's. Struggling to suppress his emotions, he turned to face the camp, pondering how many of the people he knew, including those he had met today, might end up dead, despite his efforts to prevent it. He wondered how many would survive this war. Turning to Venezi, Art saw her shoulders shaking as she clutched her flask tightly. Quickly wiping away a tear, he stood up. Sylvie, keep watch for the night, he requested. Sure, Sylvie replied, her voice softer and more comforting than usual. Transforming into her original form, she startled Venezi out of her melancholy. With a powerful flap of her black wings, Sylvie soared upward disappearing into the night sky. Art extended his hand toward Venezi. Come on, the night is still young, and it seems the soldiers have no intention of stopping. As their captain, you should join them rather than moping around up here. 